Today's daf we're going to learn is Eruvin Ayin Dalid. Today's daf is dedicated by Yehudit Robinson in honor of Sarah Robinson, Mishnah and Talmud teacher at Manhattan Day School, and by Nava Levine in honor of Rachel Levy, with appreciation to a most enthusiastic and encouraging Chavruta. Thank you for helping me on this daf, Yomi Dera. Happy birthday. Mazal Tov. We're going to start, we mentioned something yesterday, and we're now going to go more in depth into this, which is goes back to something, as I mentioned yesterday, we learned on daf Ayin Bet which according to most of the Mepharshim is explained in the following way. When we have a Mavoy, what did we say? We have an alley. A bunch of our courtyards open up into an alley. In order to permit carrying in that alley, and we put food down, and we put up a lechi or a korah, a post that stands up, or a crossbeam that goes across the entranceway. And the size, remember we talked about the post, could be any size. I mean, it doesn't. It's just, as if you remember from the whole beginning of the Masechet, it's to have some sort of noticeable, right? This isn't a public thoroughfare. It's not Rashid or Rabin, but because it's a little similar because there's a lot of people. So we need to put up some sort of reminder that you can't cross this line, right? Don't walk past here. Or some people view it as an imaginary machitza, almost like it creates a wall. So it was either wall, machitza, or hekir, something noticeable. But we talked about the difference between that, what's needed in a case where you want to allow carrying within the alleyway and all the people could carry in the alley versus the case where we had of a courtyard that there was a wall. Normally a courtyard has a wall around it. Remember all the pictures we've been seeing, the courtyards have walls, but there was what we call a pirza, a break in the wall, more than 10 cubits wide. What do we need to do to fix that opening? in order to say this is still a private space. That case, we needed something more serious. We needed either two posts, two side posts, or one post, but there was four tvachim wide, four hands breadth, hand breaths wide, not, right, not just any size, any, any width. The second, oh, so either we need two lechayayim, two of the, of the side posts, one that's much thicker than the regular, or a tsurat petach, which is, again, this formation of a, a doorway, right, where you have two l'chayayim and one going across, right, the, cro- the cross, po- uh, cross beam. Why the difference? Normally, you would think we're more stringent with a mavoy because a mavoy is much more public, so wouldn't we be more stringent there? Why are we more stringent in a chatzar? And the reason we said, uh, that's the main reason given, there might be others, but that's the main reason given is a chatzer, in order to deal with an opening in the courtyard and still, and what's the deal with all of this? We're trying to figure out how can we carry in this space. So when you have your own private courtyard, of course you can carry in there. But if it's open, palutz, and it's, there's a breach in it, and it's very big opening, then it becomes public. How do you change it from public to private? Well, it all depends, likewise with the mavoy. The mavoy is open on one side to the public thoroughfare. How do we turn that into something private? What's interesting is, you might think, well, the mavoy is already much more public, so we're going to be more stringent. But it's the opposite. Because it's more public and there's more people going around in this mavoy, the expectation of the people inside is that there's not going to be a lot of privacy. Whereas in a chatzir, it's generally something where it's just you and another family, maybe two families. It's a very private space. We talked about this once before, right? Would, would you walk out to dump your garbage, right? Would you dress in a way? You might not walk out into the street dress that way, but you might walk to dump your garbage, you know, in schleppy clothes or something, right? But you might not walk out on the street that way. So in a chatzir, we expect less, more privacy. Because we expect more privacy, once there's a breach, we have to cover it up more significantly. There has to be more of a significant cover-up to basically turn it back to our private space. Since the mavoi was never going to be private in the first place, there's a lot of people wandering around in this mavoi, not as many as on the street, and that's the whole reason why it's okay to carry. But the needs for turning this from something that's open to something closed is less. Okay, And that's the whole line, which we're going to start with right now, gufa. So we're now going to go, Gufa is like we're linking into, right, when you're on a website and there's there's a hyperlink, you can go in depth into that. That's what the Gemara does. We mentioned this line before. Now we're going to go in depth and we're going to see there's a three-way debate about this between Rav, Shmuel, and Rabbi Yochanan. Amarav, bottom of Ayin Gimel Amubet, last line. Ein mavoy nitam belechi bekora ad shiu batim bechatzero p'tuchin letocho. The question that they're going to debate now is, 
when do we consider a mavoy a mavoy, and when do we give it laws like a courtyard? Now, it still might be an alleyway, but if it's an alleyway where there's not a lot of people, then already we're going to call it a chatzer for the purposes of we need more to lechayayim or lechi that's for tfachim or tzurat petach in order to allow carrying it. Because, again, the, le- the less people that are in this area means that my expectation of privacy is greater. So, Rav says you have to have batim en chatzerot, which could be, right, Rashi says, batim le chatzerot, shnei batim le chol chatzer, u shte chatzerot le mavoy. Two houses in each courtyard, two courtyards. Some people say it could be one house in a courtyard. Rashi says it's two houses in each courtyard and two courtyards. If you don't have that, then we're going to treat it like a chatzer. Rav is the most stringent because as soon as you don't have that, he's already going to require you to have a more serious blocking here of the space in order to allow carrying. Because again, it's all conceptually, it's very obvious what's going on here. To what extent do we view this space as, you know, where does it fall on the scale of public to private? Right, my house is very private. Rashid Rabim is very public. Everything else in the middle, right? Then we have Mavoy Chatzir. So when is something considered a Chatzir? When is it a Mavoy? It's not just that technically we have an alley, right, that leads to Rashid Rabim. It could be that sometimes you have an alley, but there's not a lot of people. We're already going to call that laws of Chatzir, of courtyard. Shmuel Amar, second opinion, Afilu bayit achad achad. Even one. Okay, Rashi again, there's different interpretations. Rashi says, Dibor matchil, bayit achad v'chatzer achad, the second Rashi on the page. Bayit below chatzer, v'chatzer she bayit achad patuach la. That's one is a house without a courtyard, and one is a court. Here, I'll show you a picture, actually. There's a picture of this in the picture book. So the first picture, 240, is this. You have a house in a courtyard, that opens up to the Mavoy. On the other side of the Mavoy, you have a house. No courtyard to the house, just a house. Okay, so that's your picture. Now, according to this, we're going to say, right, he obviously requires less. Even if it's more private, still, there's an alley. There's one thing on one side. There's one thing on the other. There's two. It doesn't even matter which side it's on. The point being that two things open up to this Mavoy, two areas, could be one person in one and one person in the other, that doesn't matter to us, that's fine. Rabbi Yochanan goes the farthest to be lenient. Rabbi Yochanan Amar, afilu chorva, even if on one side you have a courtyard, okay, presumably he would say even with one house in the courtyard, and the other side you have a chorva, what's a chorva? It's a house that nobody lives in, a deserted house. So even though nobody's living there, the fact that there's a house already means we have two things leading out to this alley. Okay, that's a radical shita. So we're going to start with that opinion right away. First, we're going to deal with that just in terms of structure. Today's structure is going to be very clear. We're going to start with Rabbi Yochanan. We're going to do two things to Rabbi Yochanan. One is ask a question. Then we're going to have a, an attempt to connect this with a different opinion of Rabbi Yochanan. Then we're going to move to Shmuel, and we're going to say, does Shmuel really hold what he holds? And then we're going to bring a story where it sounds like he doesn't. And then we're going to bring another story to try to prove, or not a, actually the first isn't a story, it's a statement, he says. And then we're going to try to see, does he change his mind about this or not, based on the, the question they asked against him. And then we're going to move, we're not actually going to discuss Rav's opinion specifically about this, but we're going to move to some other statement Rav made and connect it with this topic. Okay, that's our structure for today. It's actually a fairly straightforward, a little simpler daf than the last number of dapim that have been quite complicated. Today's daf is a little bit simpler. So Rabbi Yochanan says, Afilu churva. So I'm a Abai le Rav Yosef. Abai says to Rav Yosef, I'm a Rabbi Yochanan, afilu b'shvil shel kamim. If you don't need someone living there, then what if one side of the mavoy has, again, it doesn't really matter one side, but let's just assume one side of the, of the alley has a house and a courtyard, and the other has a vineyard. Would that work? Because if you don't need people living there, what's the difference if it's a, a deserted house or uh, a, a vineyard? Amarle, low. Okay, he says, no, that's not the case. A shvil shal kramim, Rabbi Yochanan would not think so. Why? Amar Rabbi Yochanan, lo amar, I should read it this way. Lo amar Rabbi Yochanan, ela bechorva, dechazu lidira. When he talked about a des- uh, deserted house, he was talking about a deserted house. It's a house, which means 
you could potentially live there. Maybe the house has fallen apart. And, you know, I always think of these haunted houses when I think of a chorva, right? You think about one of these house shacks nobody ever wants to live in. But theoretically, somebody could live there. But he wasn't talking about a place like a vineyard where it's not even potentially able for somebody. Nobody can live there. So it has to be, okay, he's not that lenient to say, even if there was a field or a vineyard or something like that. He only means if it's someplace someone can live. So that was the first thing we did with Rabbi Yochanan. We asked a question and we resolved it. Now we move on. Rabbi Yochanan matches what he says somewhere else. Now this is a bit of a strange one. You would have expected that we're going to find a place where Rabbi Yochanan considers something like a chorva, like a house or something along those lines. But that's not what we're going to do here. Right now, we're kind of zooming in or spotlighting on a different perspective of what comes out of what Rabbi Yochanan said. Not what we were focusing on, okay? Not the issue of how many, you know, what do you need for something to be considered a chatzer or a mavoy, but a different issue. The fact that he says that you could put up a lechi and a kola in this alley, which has a house on one side, excuse me, which has a house on one side, and on the other side it has um, a chorva, a deserted house, from here you learn something else. Okay, you might, we're, we're basically going to say, I'll kind of preface it so that you know where we're going. You might have thought that there'd be an issue here that maybe you wouldn't allow carrying in here because of some other side issue, and we're going to see the fact that he's not worried about that matches his opinion somewhere else where he's also not worried about something. So we'll get to all the details. I, I'm not filling them in yet, but we'll fill them in as we read. So Rabbi Yochanan goes, lishitato, litame. That means he goes according to his, his own logic. Ditna. There's a mission that says, we've learned this a number of times, okay, whether you read Amar Rabbi Shimon or not, but this is Rabbi Shimon's opinion. See, it's in parentheses. Echad gagot, ve'echad karpifot, ve'echad chatserot, rishut echad hen lekelim sheshavtu letochan, ve'lo lekelim sheshavtu betoch habayit. Remember these spaces? These are spaces that are more public spaces of our, right, of our city. So if you have, okay, let's start with basics. You have a house, it's in a courtyard, and then your friend has a courtyard next to you. So can you carry from one to the other? So things that are in your house cannot be taken out to the courtyard unless you do an Eruv in your courtyard. That's what Eruv Chatzerot lets you. Between courtyards you can't carry because... You have to do an Erev also to combine our things. But according to Rabbi Shimon, since nobody lives in a chatzer, in a courtyard, nobody lives in the roof, nobody lives in a karpaf, right, which is a, a big open space, right, or a space that's used for storage or something like that. It's not a living space. That's the main thing. Since these are not living spaces, one can carry objects from one of these spaces to the other. And the issue is only living spaces. So therefore... If, but it's very particular what you can carry. What can you carry between Gago, Karpifo, Vechatzero within the city, even if you don't have an Eruv? What does he say? They're they're considered one entity for what? For Kaelin, Shashavtu, Litochan. Any items that you had out in the courtyard or on your roof, that can be moved to other roofs or to other courtyards or to other, right? They can't be used to house, can't be moved to houses. And you can't move items from, and that's what they say right now. Lola Kelim Shavtu What does it mean Shavtu? Remember? Shavtu means they were there when Shabbat started. So if Shabbat starts and your object, your whatever it is you want to move is in your house, you can't move it. You can't say, oh, I'll bring it out to my courtyard, let's say because I have an A roof, and then from there I'm going to move it to the other courtyards. No, you can't do that. The only things that Rabbi Shimon thinks you can move from courtyard to courtyard, again, without an A roof, excuse me. The only things are objects that start in the chatzer or in the gag or right if they're in a space that's not meant for living then you can carry them from one to the other so now do we hold like rabbi shimon or not i'm a rav we're now going to see again our three people that we started with rav shmuel and rabbi yochanan rav says halacha ke rabbi shimon accept one big exception v'hu shelo irvu only in the case where you didn't make an eruv in your in your courtyard if you made an Erev in your courtyard, what does he say? Aval Irvu, what, once you make an Erev in your own courtyard, you now are no longer, it's funny, right? You do something to allow and ends up forbidden. You now cannot carry items from your courtyard 
to the next door courtyard or any other courtyard in the city for all intents and purposes because what are we worried about? That even if you want to carry something that was in your courtyard from before Shabbat, we don't allow it because maybe you'll mistake and you'll make a mistake and what will you do? You'll carry something from your house to the courtyard and then you'll say, oh, well, I can carry from courtyard to courtyard. So you'll take that item from your house and you'll carry it to the nearby courtyard. And there you don't have an Eruv. So therefore, let's read it inside. He says, We're worried that maybe you'll take out Kelim, Mane is Kelim, Kelim from your house to the courtyard. And therefore, we're forbidding that. Shmuel says, we hold like, um, like Rabbi Shimon, no matter what. In other words, we assume, and this is a good example of how much are we worried about people not, right, missing, missing the details, right, that they, they won't realize. Shmuel says, no, the halacha is, things from the chatzar can be moved. People know what was in their chatzar before Shabbat, what wasn't. They know that they can only move things that were in their roof or in their courtyard, in their karpaf. They're not Right? We're not worried about people messing that up. And therefore, sees no reason. He says, it doesn't matter whether you made an or whether you didn't. You can still carry items that were in your courtyard before Shabbat or in your roof and move them from roof to roof. If you remember, there was a story, I think it was a Brit Milah, and they needed a knife maybe, and they carried it from roof to roof, Karpat, right? And they, so they did this. And so Shmuel says, Bein Eru, Bein Loru. Now remember, why did we start this? Rabbi Yochanan. So where's Rabbi Yochanan? Ah, he finally appears here. The Chayin Amar Rabbi Yochanan. He says, just like Shmuel. In this case, they don't disagree. Halacha ke Rabbi Shimon, Bein Eru, U Bein Lo Eru. Okay, the Halacha is like Rabbi Shimon, whether they did an Eru, whether they didn't. Now, what do you see here? How does this connect to our case? Again, I, I warned you from the beginning. This doesn't connect to when do we consider something a mavoy or a chatzer? This relates to a different aspect of, again, what did Rabbi Yochanan talk about? An alley, a chorva on one side, right? A broken down house on one side and a courtyard with somebody living there on the other. So now, what do you see here? Just like Rabbi Yochanan, lo gazrin and dilma ati lafuke mani debatim lechatzer, he's not worried that if we allow you, you made an of here, then we'll, you might accidentally take items out of your house, move them to the courtyard, move them from courtyard to courtyard. In the second case we just brought, hachanami, likewise in our case, lo gazlin an ati lafuke mane de, de chatzer lachorva. If we allow you to fix this mavoi with a lechi or a kora, then what might happen? You have your house and your courtyard. Your courtyard now, you fixed your courtyard with this lechi or kora, which means you can now carry from your courtyard to the alley. That's what it allows you to do. And theoretically to other courtyards that were part of the Eruf, right? The, the shituf mevo'ot that you did by putting up, again, they don't, it's just important to note here, they don't talk about the food aspect. Obviously, if there's other people living in the courtyard, you would need food also. But they're focusing on the issue of the lechi or the kora right now. You have a chorva here. Now, the chorva, did they join the shituf mevo'ot? No. There's no owner there to join the shituf mevo'ot, which means that when you do, you put up this lechi or kora at the entrance of your alley, which leads on one side to a chorva, on the other, again, I'm just saying side, it doesn't really have to be different sides, but on one side to a chorva, one side to this courtyard where this person lives, that mavoy, that lechi or kora, doesn't help you to move into any items into the chorva. If you want to move something there, you can't. Because the chorva is not part of this because there's no owner. So now, if Rabbi Yochanan says in this case you can make a lechi or a kora and fix the courtyard in that way, that one can carry from your courtyard to the alley, you might think, right, if you were the worrier type, like Rav, and Rav is worried that if we allow you to do this, we'll allow you to do something else, then you would say the same thing here. You'd say, if we're going to allow you to move from your courtyard to your, to your alley, we might you might come to bring items into the chorva as well. So what do we see here? The fact that Rabbi Yochanan is not concerned with that. And that's why I said we're spotlighting a different issue. We weren't even talking about that issue before. Before it was just a matter of size and what makes it, what crosses the line between mavoy to chatzir, right? What turns something into more private. But additionally, he's not worried you're going to move anything into the chatzir and that matches his opinion elsewhere. So, so far we dealt with Rabbi Yochanan. Now we're moving into Shmuel. So here we're going to have a bunch of stories or discussions that ensued. Yativ Rav Kahana, uh, sorry, Rav Brona, Vika'amar Lahashmata. So Rav Brona now is teaching Shmuel that one house, one courtyard is already enough to be considered a Mavoy. And then you only need a Lechi and a Korah. 
So now, Amrale Rabbi Elazar. Rabbi Elazar hears Rabona teaching this, and he says, Bar be Rav, Talmid Chacham, you, you know, you wise student, Amr Shmuel Hachi, does Shmuel really say this? Now, we don't really know why he's asking that, but we'll see very soon. Amr Le'in, he says, yes, Shmuel really did say this. So now, right, this is classic, you hear something a student said, the teacher said, and you think, hmm, teacher really say this? I'm going to go check it out with the teacher. So, Amr Ach Ve'le Ushpize, go show me your guest, meaning, go find me Shmuel, I want to talk to him. Ach Ve'le, so he points him out where he is. So now Rabbi Elazar comes before Shmuel and he says to him, Amar le, Amar mar hachi, did you really say this? Amar le, in, yes, in fact, I did say this. You have a problem, right? What's your issue? So Rabbi Elazar says, but wait, contradict something you said elsewhere. Remember, we've quoted this a number of times, right? When it comes to Erevin, we follow our Mishnah. What about the Mishnah do we follow? Right, this is an analogy. Mavoy to chatzerot is like chatzerot to batim. I feel like I'm back doing the SATs, right? The, it's analogies. So what does this mean? Right, just like analogies there are complicated. What does this mean exactly? So when you have one house, when you have a chatzer made up of houses, right, that's when you have a din of chatzerot, when it's a number of houses in a courtyard. Likewise, it has to be a number of courtyards in a mavoy. And you said, buy it v'chatzer, which means it could have one courtyard only and as long as there's a house. But you said elsewhere that a mavoy, right, uh, uh, let's say it like this, house to courtyard is like courtyards to mavoy, which means you need multiple chatzerot, like Rav said. So how could you possibly say that? So now it's interesting to see Shmuel's reaction. Ishtik, he was silent. Okay, what does that mean? That could mean a lot of things, right? we say sometimes, silence is admitting. So maybe he's admitting that you're right and I, I'm wrong and I'm changing my mind. Silence could be, what, what kind of question are you bothering me with? It's such a silly question. I'm not even taking the, the time to answer you. Okay, maybe that's not the best approach for an educator to do. But sometimes rabbis say, that's such a crazy question. I'm not even going to bother answering you. Not worth my time and effort. So we don't really know what he means. And in fact, the Gemara asks, did he accept it or did he not accept it? So we're going to see the following story. Okay, so we kind of started with a story of this. It wasn't really a story. It was an interaction between these rabbis and a discussion, right? Did, did you really say this or not? And then we don't know what's the end of the story. Did he change his mind? Did he not? So let's look at another story. Tashma. Okay, from here till the end of the daf, I'm going to already tell you that it's a very short daf. You can see if you turn the page. It's very short. But they're missing a lot of words here, okay? They, now, whenever it's missing, you know that already if we're going to add words, probably there's debates about what words we're adding. So I'm just also letting you know in advance that not everybody agrees with all the details that have to be added. Some everyone is in agreement about, and some, you know, are sort of interpretation. Because the Gemara kind of left out a lot of details that, you know, were pretty important to understanding. And that's the job of the, of the commentators to kind of add, fill in the blanks, add all the missing details that without that you can't really understand the Gemara. So here's our story. His name is Ivut Bar Ihi. He lived in a Mavoy. Now presumably there wasn't, and now again we don't know the details, but there wasn't Rav's criteria for Mavoy of two Chatzerot and two houses. Okay, There wasn't that. Let's just go with, Rashi, with Rashi's interpretation that what Rav requires is two houses in two courtyards, okay? That that wasn't the case. He lived in one courtyard. Maybe there was another courtyard. We're going to see soon. I'll kind of fill in the details that we're going to see later that he lived in a courtyard, presumably with another house. Let's assume we go with Rashi. And in the next door courtyard, there was a house and there was a shul, okay? We're going to see that somebody slept in the shul but didn't eat in the shul. There was a shamash and he slept there but didn't eat there. So there was a mavoy which didn't have Rub's criteria of what was needed, have a dire by Ivut Bar E, so he lived there. Avid Le Lechaya, he put up his own lechi. Okay, this is classic, right? He didn't ask a rabbi, he put it up. But Shara Le Shmuel, he probably asked Shmuel about it, and Shmuel said, Yes, your lechi is good. Okay, which shows that what? That Shmuel seemed to think that it's okay, you don't need Rav's criteria for courtyard. Okay? So now, do we know if he changed his mind or not? So from this story, one can assume 
that he didn't change his mind, that he still kept with his original thinking that you don't need all the criteria for a mavoi that Rav needed. And in fact, you could say, one could say, well, maybe this wasn't, maybe he changed his mind, maybe this happened earlier in his life, but the next line, Ata Rav Anan, if you look in Rashi, the first Yibor Matriel and Amabet, Amar Rav Anan La'achar Mot Shmuel. After Shmuel dies, okay, this is classic, we've seen a lot of stories where all of a sudden after someone dies, somebody comes in and changes something that they didn't have the guts to do when the rabbi was still alive, but when he dies, now it sounds like that's what's happening, although we're going to see it's not exactly why that Shmuel's death seemed to have caused something else which caused the change, but we'll get to that soon. Rav Anan comes along, Shadye, and he takes down the lechi. Sounds like the story we saw in the beginning with the Reish Galuta, and he took down the lechi that he didn't like. Anyway, he takes off the lechi. Amar, so now comes along our, our, our person who was living there, Ivut. Ivut bar says, Mivoad dayaranabe, vatina mishmei de mar Shmuel, neitu Rav Anan barav nishyemin. I've been living here all my life with this lechi, and Shmuel said it was fine. Who, what, what rights do you come into my mavoy, into my alley, and knock down my lechi? Shmuel said it was fine. What's wrong with it? So, Shmamina, what can you infer from here? The fact that this happened after the death of Shmuel, it seems like Shmuel, until his death, thought that this was fine. And therefore, what do we say? Lo kivlemine, he obviously didn't change his mind. The fact that he questioned him, he didn't change his mind. Now, you could say he ignored his question. You could say he understood that statement that he said elsewhere about we have to follow the Mishnah, maybe some other way, or maybe he changed his mind about that statement. Maybe he said, oh, I take that statement back. Okay, so basically that's what happens. But now the Gemara says, no, you miss the details of the story. That's not what happened. Now, in fact, we don't really know what the truth is, okay? In the end, we're not going to know, did Shmuel change his mind or did he not? Because we can read this story in two ways. The first way sounds like he changed, he didn't change his mind. But the second reading, we're going to see he did change his mind. So if he changed his mind, then why did he allow this lechi? Because it wasn't, you know, as, I took, as I said before, there were really two houses in two courtyards. It's just that one was a shul. And then the question was, what changed when Shmuel died? So what we're going to learn, okay, again, it doesn't say this inside, and that's why it's a little tricky, but what happened was when Shmuel died, the shamash of the shul left living in the shul. He lived in the shul before. He didn't live in the shul anymore. So let's read. By the way, this is the first time the Gemara mentions this chazan living there. It didn't tell us any of the details of the story before. Now we're going to see there was a chazan living there, which is really a shamash, not a chazan the way we call a chazan, but like a shamas, you know, his job was to take care of the shul. And he, now what did he do in this, in this shul? He had a house also. So he would eat in his home, but but he would sleep in the Beit Knesset. Okay, he would sleep in the shul. Now, what do you remember? We have a debate. What can, constitutes you for being for a roof? If you remember, Rav said, Makom Pita, it's where you eat. Now, if you hold by Rav, then he doesn't, he's not considered a resident here. But what did Shmuel hold? Makom Linagorem, which means he's a resident because he's sleeping there, even though he's not eating there. So according to Shmuel, now we're going to see this was a case of two houses and two courtyards because this courtyard had two houses, or maybe you'd say one, and it was just this guy, um, Ivut, and the shul. But there were two courtyards because it was a place of sleep. So now why did Ivut not get that? So Ivut bar Ihi, when he got all upset, now what happened? So let's just go through the story. Originally, he was sleeping there every night. Because he was sleeping there, that made it a living place for Eruv, which means he could join. It was considered two courtyards opening up to this alley, which means you can use a lechi or a korah. And that's what Shmuel said. When Shmuel died, now it's not sure if it's, there's a connection. Because he died, he was no longer connected to the shul anymore. I don't know. But the fact is, when Shmuel died, he leaves. So he's no longer sleeping there. If he's no longer sleeping there, he's not eating there, he's not anything there, then obviously it becomes back to a shul, which means it's not a house of residence, which means it has no significance when it comes to Eruv, which means that we can't count this courtyard as a courtyard for the purposes of Eruv. So that's why Rav Anan came and took it down. Evil didn't get that. Why not? Evil bar savar makom pita going. He thought, what makes it significant? If you eat there. Now, what did he think then? 
he looked at Shmuel and he said, hey, nothing changed really because he wasn't eating there in the first place and he's not eating there now. So when Shmuel died, nothing changed. And he assumed that when Shmuel was alive, why did he allow it? Because he didn't require two houses, two courtyard, two houses and two courtyards. He just required a courtyard and a house. And, you know, let's just assume there was another house with the Beit Knesset, so that was sufficient. Ivo thought that Shmuel wasn't considering the shul in the picture at all because food is what's kovah, and this Chazam wasn't eating there. So he thought that Shmuel was holding by what Shmuel originally held by. But it doesn't mean that Shmuel was actually holding that way because Shmuel himself, Lita'ameh, and Amar Makom Okay, now, I'll say it in these words. I don't mean it with any lack of respect, but the Gemara is adding details to the story, okay? You could say making up details, maybe. In other words, no, I don't think that they knew the real details of this case, but what they're trying to do is they're saying we could fill in details. That if you want to try to prove one way that he changes, that he didn't change his mind, we could try to prove the other way that he did change his mind. And if you fill in details to the story that make it sound like, you know, the follow the approach that he did change his mind, you could do that also. So this is, we don't really know what happened in the story. We don't, you know, was, was there a chazan? Did he move? Did he this? Was he eating? Was he sleeping? But they're saying, you could say that maybe that was the situation. Now, maybe they knew there was a shul there. In other words, it's not clear what details they knew and which details they kind of uh, added to the story to make it make sense either which way. And basically what they're saying is, it's nice to have the story, but the story doesn't prove anything about which more really held and did he change his mind or not. Okay, now we're moving on to a different statement of Rav, which is going to connect to this mavoi unless you have two chatzay road and two batim. Amar Rav Yehuda Amar Rav, or we'll see, does it connect or does it not? There's a bit of a debate about it. So Rav Yehuda says in the name of Rav, Mavoy shetzido achad ovei kochavim, v'tzido achad Yisrael. This case also, by the way, there's a debate about what exactly the situation is. I'll show you a picture right now, and you'll see how at least Rashi understands it. We will go according to that interpretation. But like I said, there are different interpretations to how to read this. So we have, we're at picture number 241. A mavoy. You have an alley. You have a Gentile living on one side of the alley. On the other side, you have a Jew. But if you notice, it's not just a typical, okay, it looks like one house, but it's not really one house. These are three different people living here. Okay, now you have. If you're, okay, in case you don't have the picture, I'll describe it in words. You walk, there's only one entrance to this structure. You walk into one house, that's where one Jew lives. In the back of that Jew's house, there's windows. Now, some people say, they talk about windows in the Gemara. Some people say only windows. If it was doors, it would be different. Some people say it could be windows, it could be doors. It doesn't really make a difference. The main thing is that there's only one exit to the Mavoy from this space, and it's through one person's house. All the other two people that are living, let's say in this picture, there's two other people living there, their windows of their houses open up into the back of the Jew's house, and, right, they're also Jewish, and how do they get out of their house? They get out through doors on the other side. If you see, their doors lead straight to the public domain. It doesn't really matter where their doors lead to. The point is, it doesn't lead to this alleyway. We're dealing with an alleyway that has one entrance to an Andrew's house, one entrance to a Jew's house, but it's not a case of one Jew living with a Gentile because there's other Jews living there also. What's their access point to this non-Jew? Well, in order to get to the non-Jew, they have to go through the windows or through doors maybe, okay? Let's just assume it's windows. Then already we're going to see that their access is, it's not so accessible to them to get out through the house of the other person. Number one, they have to climb through windows. Number two, they have to go through someone's house, right? If you say doors, you say, well, it's not that the, it's a window they have to go through. It's just that they still have to go through someone else's house in order to get to the the Mavoy. So now what does he say? So let's start from the beginning. Right? One side Gentile, one side Jew. These people living in this structure where one opens it to the other, the Jews in this alley cannot make an Erev together. Okay? And we don't yet know why. We'll get to this soon. But they can't make an Erev together. So Abai wants to figure out why they can't make an Erev together. And he says, Amalei Abai le Rav Yosef. Amalav, right, when you try to figure things out, so you ask, would this be applicable also in another situation? And that would help you to figure out what the reason is. So he says, Amalav afilu bechatzer, would Rav say the same thing? If instead of the house of the Jew 
opening into a mavoi. Okay, now let's look at picture number 242. They have, a, instead of the Jew and the Gentile having a shared alley, what if they had a shared courtyard? Would it be the same? So Amar Lei, Rav Yosef answers in, says, yes, it's true. It would be the same. Rav would hold the same halacha. But he then continues and says, Di lo Amar Mai. Why would you have thought to make this distinction between a chatzer and a mavoi? Okay, you can ask why would you have thought to, and you can also ask why wouldn't you have thought to. But let's start with Rav Yosef's question is to Abai, why did you think maybe Rav would make a distinction? What were you trying to figure out? So he says, Hava Amina, I would have thought, Tama de Rav, Mishum de Kasaval, Ein Mavoi Nitar Velechi Bekora, Ad Shiyu Batim Bechatzero Ptuchin Letocho. He says, I would have thought, go back to the Mavoi case, picture number 241. Why can't these Jews make an Eruv together through their houses? Because you can't allow, and then that would be basically be to allow them, because then you'd have basically one group of people in this Mavoi. Now the Gentile, remember what we learned, Dirat Nochri Lo Shma Dira. Remember, we, the whole thing, the whole premise that the beginning of our parak was based on is a Gentile's house is not actually considered a house, which means, right, we forbid we make you rent the space of the of the Gentile because we don't want you to end up living in a courtyard with them, remember? But, and we only, and in what case do we make you do it? Only if there's more than one person living in the courtyard. If there's only one person, we don't. But anyway, what's the theory here? If we say, dirat nochui lo shma dira, then we basically ignore the whole second part of this mavoi. In the end, what do you really have? You have one section, right, one house opening up into this Mavoy, and you have Jews living, you have a few Jews living there. So what does he say? Maybe this wouldn't be a case, going back to where we started today, of two chatzerot open into a Mavoy, because, right, maybe you would, this case is one chatzer of Jews living there, and that's it. The chatzer of the Mavoy, and of the Nochri, the Gentile, is not considered a chatzer, because his dira is lo shma dira, which means that this isn't a case where you can use a lechi or korah. What would you need? Two lechayayim, and right, you need something more. So when it says, when he says, ein ma'arvino to derech halano latiro derech ptachim la mavoy, what he means is, if you just put a lechi and a korah up on this mavoy, that won't work for you. Why? Because this doesn't have the criteria needed for a mavoi, to allow a lechi korah, of two chatserot, because the Gentiles, chatser is not factoring into the picture. So comes a and he says, that's what I would have thought, which means what? If you move to a chatser, right, then this is not an issue, because the issue was, is this considered a halachic mavoi? But that wouldn't be relevant, a relevant question for the chatser, right? This would be fine for a chatzir because you have walls up here in the chatzir. In other words, and then we ignore the house of the nochri, and it's just some Jews living in a chatzir. Of course they can make an eruv between them, no problem. So that's what he says I would have thought. Okay, and then what the Gemara is going to do tomorrow is figure out, well, if that's what you would have thought, why would Rav need to say this if it's based on the same principle as and that's why the Gemara starts off, Tarte Lamali, according to you, Abai, you're thinking. You know, this is all his hypothetical question. Why did you think Rav would have to say both statements if they're really all based on one and the same? Because we didn't really get to what does Rav Yosef really think, where Rav Yosef says Rav actually means it in both cases. I'll just kind of skip ahead for a quick minute. I must have a little bit of time. I want to skip ahead for a quick minute, which is that... Um, that the reason why is because, why does he think chatzir mavoi, it's all the same, and basically we're not going to allow them to make an roof. It's very simple. Because theoretically, what do you really have here? Since only the, the first, the Jew in the front house, okay, let's pull up the picture for one quick minute. The Jew in the front house is really the only one who has access to the courtyard, right? Or to the mavoi, whichever one it would be. And the Gentile is the only other person who does. The two Jews living behind go out the other way. They don't really have access. That's where we started. Because they don't have access, this looks like a classic case of one Jew living in a courtyard with one Gentile. If you remember, the whole thing is we don't want to allow that kind of thing because, right, because the, or again, that's that's a rare case. Remember, that was the whole thing. So because we view this as we don't allow them to make an Eruv 
because, okay, we're going to see that tomorrow, Afilu Chatser, this is on the next page on line number five, Tama Derav de Kasavar, Asur Lasot Yachib in Komovei Kochavim. You can't, we don't want to have a, one person living with an Ovei Kochavim because we're worried he's going to learn from his actions and therefore we don't want to allow the Jew to carry in this shared space that he shares only with the Gentile. And therefore, if we don't allow him to make an Eruv, then he'll only be allowed to carry in his house. He won't be able to carry into the courtyard or into the Mavoy, whichever case it might be. But if we allow him to make an Eruv with all the other Jews in the courtyard or all the other Jews in the Mavoy, he's going to end up carrying out to there and then it will be a problem. Obviously, you'd have to say the Nochri would have to, right, if it's, no, there's a debate. Does the Nochri have to do, do you have to rent the Nochri space also? In addition, that's not the factor here, whether you do or whether you don't. It's a question of whether you view this as one person or where you don't actually need it versus many people. But the idea here being that we want to avoid contact with the Gentile, because again, in those days, they were all worried about the Gentiles that they were living among. And that's why they don't allow this Eru between the houses, because that will allow the Jew to carry in this space that the Jew shares with the Gentile. We'll see this all again tomorrow, because it's in tomorrow's stuff. But I didn't want to finish without you understanding what was going on here with what the real opinion of Rav is, according to Rav Yosef, that he holds even a Mavu, even a Pachatzer. This has nothing to do with is a Mavu initar belechi or Kora. That's what Abaye thought, which is why he distinguished between the case of Mavo and Chatzir. But in the end, the answer is no, it's all the same. And this is a different issue. And that's not the issue that we're discussing here. Okay, we'll stop with that for today and uh, pick up from here tomorrow. We're nearing, just so you know, we're nearing the end of the parak. We'll finish the parak very shortly. Okay. Have a great day, everyone.